Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Nano Talks. This Nano Talk is again a recording of a user webinar we did recently, at this time with Dr. Lorena Ruiz Perez, who is a user of our ocean system and she used it to do this liquid phase TM uh, research on soft organic materials. So now we will jump into the webinar and you will first uh, see me introduce Lorena to the audience and then she will start her presentation. After the presentation, there will be some questions from the audience that will be answered by Lorena. So please enjoy this nano talk. Dr. Lorena Ruiz Perez completed her undergraduate degree in physics in Spain and earned her PhD in polymer physics at the Department of Physics and Astronomy the University of Sheffield in the UK. Following her PhD, she worked as a postdoc research associate in the Department of Engineering Materials Chemistry and Biomedical Science at the University of Sheffield. In 2014, she moved to London, where she took some time off research to uh, teach math, uh, math and physics in secondary schools, disseminate subject expertise and champion university access. Now, since 2016, Lorena manages the EPSRC GEO Center for Liquid Phase Electromicroscopy at the University College of London, UCL, where she has focused on developing and establishing novel techniques for in situ transmission electromicroscopy imaging of soft organic materials and biological systems in liquid phase. So, welcome, Lorena. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Thank you very You're much welcome. for the nice presentation and uh, thank you very much for inviting me um, to present and work with you at UCL. I'm just going to stop sharing my webcam so that um, uh, the internet connection will work better. So I'm just going to yeah. show you, stop it and I'm going to start now. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about a 4D liquid phase TM of soft organic materials. And um, this is the work we've been doing with liquid since we opened the liquid facility at UCL. So soft materials and proteins in particular have water as one of the main building blocks. So when image them in TM, um, when imaging them in TM, it's very important that you don't remove the water because the water is an important part. And for this reason, the leading technique for imaging soft biological materials is cryo-EM. As we know in cryo, the water component is not removed, but is vitrified and then um, is so preserved. So cryo-TM has seen tremendous developments in the last decades. And one can certainly speak of a resolution revolution by looking at how the resolution has improved over the years. And these achievements granted the Nobel Prize to Dubuchet, Frank and Henderson in 2017. However, the main limitation of cryo-TM is that time is literally frozen. So it is its inability to image dynamic processes. And one can take snapshots of time points in a dynamic process, but some information is still missed. And so nowadays, it's not only about how small can you image, but how fast. Because with the development of new detectors, we can now acquire fast frame videos, which are needed for capturing dynamic processes. So the work that I'm presenting today is the work we've done, as I said in the beginning, at the Center of Liquid Electromicroscopy at UCL, which will open on July 17. This center is comprised by a JL Gem 2200FS, which is a 200 kV back microscope with an in-column omega filter. We have the two holders, the two liquid holders from DEMS, the uh, new generation holder, the stream holder, and the first generation, which is the ocean holder. The work that I'm going to present today is the work we did with the ocean holder. And we did it with a direct electron detection camera, the K2 in situ from GATAN, which allows you low dose imaging. In the work of Liquid TM, we have two PhD students, uh, Cesare De Pace, who does the experimental side of liquid, and Gabriele, who does the computational side of the liquid experiments. I'm showing you here an outline of uh, the contents of my talk today. First, I'm going to talk about liquid TM of soft materials, the challenges and opportunities. And I'm just going to show you some of the projects that we've been doing. And then I'm going to start presenting advanced techniques towards 4D microscopy, 
in uh, Brownian tomography and Brownian particle analysis. But before I start, I'm going to talk about soft matter a little bit. And soft matter can be described as the physics of the everyday life. And it is the branch of physical science that studies all the systems that are deformed by relatively low energy, typically of the magnitude of thermal fluctuations. They are mesoscopic, so they have sizes ranging from a few atoms to micrometers large. They are soft, so they are held together by forces whose magnitude is comparable to thermal energies. Polymers are subjected to Brownian motion, so they are constantly and randomly moving when they are in solution. They are complex, which means they're hierarchical and they're made of molecules that self-assemble and sometimes they form really complex arrangements. And they're dynamic, so each component relative position changes over a time scale defined as relaxation time. And I'm going to be mentioning some of these terms, some of these concepts along my talk today. So uh, the different disciplines such as maths, physics, chemistry, biology, engineering and materials do converge into the field of soft matter. So we come traditionally from a polymer group and so it makes sense to us that the first sample we imaged in liquid was what we produced in the lab. So we started using a biocompatible block of polymer that has been widely used in our group as a drug delivery system. It's an amphiphilic block of polymer comprised of a hydrophobic and a hydrophobic uh, hydrophilic block that can self-assemble in solution. It's a uh, phosphorine-choline-based pH-sensitive block of polymer. So in the way they work is that the hydrophobic block tries to minimize contact with the water while the hydrophilic block tries to maximize the contact. And so uh, depending on the ratio between the two blocks and the, the different units that you have in the blocks, they can form these different assembles. They can, help, they can form micelles, they can help form a worm like micelles, polymersome and these like micelles. And the work I'm going to show you today uh, has been done with uh, worm-like muscles, polymersomes, and these-like muscles. So in this first example, I show you here a polymersome structure in water imaged by a liquid stem. So as you see, the structures are fully hydrated. Uh, you can see the dense core in the middle and uh, the membrane uh, fully, uh, like I said, fully hydrated with no need for staining agents. Now, if you image these sort of systems with dry TM, very often the staining can crystallize on the membrane. You have some polymer deflation because of the dehydration process of the sample preparation. You can have uh, different artifacts when you prepare the sample. But something that can also be done with liquid TM is exploit the effects of the beam in the system to drive a desired change, a change that we want to monitor. Because when you shine an electron beam to water, you effectively split the water. And uh, this reduction of oxygen in water through the addition of electrons leads to the formation of reactive oxygen species, such as hydroxy, uh, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radicals, nitric oxide, and you can use this reactive oxygen species to your advantage. In this case, we used a uh, polymer, a block of polymer, which is a polymethanine-based oxidant-sensitive block of polymer. So in this case, again, as I showed you before, we have an hydrophilic block, but the hydrophobic block is made of methionine. And methionine gets oxidized by reactive oxygen species in the liquid media. And so we are going to use this uh, this effect to drive changes that we want to monitor. So uh, when you make this block of polymers, uh, you can change the total solid concentration or the degree of polymerization of the PMET block, and you can have spheres, worms, or vesicles. Um, in, the, in the cartoon in there, in the slide, you can see the brown area is the area where the methionine uh, block is. And this is the reaction that takes place when the methionine block gets in contact with the reactive oxygen species. So the methionine changes its polarity and oxidizes and goes from hydrophobic to hydrophilic. And so this has effect on the morphology that these block of polymers form. And then you can follow this redox reaction in situ and monitor how those morphologies change as a consequence of the redox reaction. So um, he, this is an example of a, a polymersome made with this polymer. In these images, we see a polymersome changing its morphology from membrane-bound spherical to irregular hyperbranch structures. 
So as the, as the hydrophobic methionine block undergoes oxidation by the reactive oxygen species, its polarity changes progressively from hydrophobic to hydrophilic. And as the methionine gets hydrophilic, it wants to be in contact with water. And so it escapes from the interior of the membrane of the vesicle to the solution outside. So this uh, oxidation reaction took place in all, under a minute. And uh, we were able to monitor it. Another thing we did with the same polymer is uh, image the conformation that it takes when it forms worm-like gels. You see there at the top right hand side what the gel looks like. It's a very thick viscous material. So we put it on the microscope and the first thing we saw was large micron sizes globular structures which is picture micrograph number one. And they're very dark on the inside, seems to be very dense. If you zoom in the region with the square, the red square inside the globular gel, you see that you have some spherical aggregates, which seems to be embedded in a matrix, which judging by the contrast seems to be a bit more viscous than the um, outside media. But if you keep zooming in, you see a tight network of worms in micrograph number three here. And if you keep going deep inside, then you see that these worms are not smooth. They seem to be twisted. And this actually matches rather well what is known of polymethionine, because methionine is known to form alpha helixes. It's not a smooth structure. And this, uh, this pattern suggests helicoidal, uh, helicoidal arrangements. So we did the same as we did with the um, Polymersome, we put it under the beam and waited and so tried to monitor the redox reaction in situ. Now, the first thing we saw was that these um, spherical structures in micrograph number two started to swell because here we have as well a problem of diffusion. The reactive oxygen species need to get inside this micron sized globular structure. But uh, so the, mm, the spherical structures started to swell. And there must be a point where there is a saturation threshold in which the reactive oxygen species reach the interior of this uh, structure. And then the redox reaction takes place. The, um, the worms become completely hydrophilic and then they don't want to be secluded anymore. They just want to escape, they want to be out. And so you see the worms untangling and escaping these structures very nicely. This, this had a quite high contrast, so we're, we were quite pleased. This whole uh, reaction took place in 20 minutes, at the end of which you see the system and the, the polymers are completely uh, degraded. But we think the big impact of liquid TM is on protein structure. So in order to assess the ability of the technique to image proteins in liquid phase, we chose the protein ferritin as a model. Uh, ferritin is very well studied, it's well understood, and as you see there is a globular protein complex with 24 chains arranged into a rigid and stable structure. It is hollow, it's a hollow spherical shell with octahedral symmetry and it's got 50 iron ions and an external diameter of 12 nanometers and an internal diameter of 8 nanometers. We have capability of cryo as well in our facilities, so we imaged it in liquid and in cryo. And we were sure to uh, do the imaging in cryo with the threshold dose known well for cryo for imaging proteins, which is 10 electrons per angstrom square. So below that cumulative dose, we know that the protein is not damaged by the beam and is uh, intact. So um, the first question that we ask ourselves is, uh, what is the resistance of ferritin to the electron beam when using liquid instead of vitrified water? Can we treat both techniques in the same way? So um, in order to explore this question, we disperse the ferritin in two different uh, solvents. First, we disperse this in dionized water at 2.5 milligrams per mil, we took a frame rate of 10 frames per second in a four second video acquisition. So as you see here at the top, this is the video uh, cut in segments of one second, and you can see how the, the dose starts to increase, obviously, in every frame. At the end, we had a cumulative dose of 120 electrons per square. Um, you see that at the beginning, we started with some round structures, and at the end, those structures were lost. We have something that resembles fibrils. 
We saw as well the, uh, how the particle diameter change with the time in the video acquisition and the relative size distribution of the ferritin at the beginning of the acquisition was a narrow peak of 12 nanometers, which was what we know about the size of ferritin. But as the video progressed, you can see this narrow peak change and now it become a broader, a broader shape, a broader peak, which suggests that the 12 nanometers uh, of the ferritin was lost at the end of the of the video. So the, the, the ferritin had been damaged, as we see here in, in this picture as well. We did the same experiment with the PBS as the solution. Uh, we kept the same concentration, same frame rate uh, for second video, but this time we deliberately uh, increased the dose. We wanted to push the system and see how much electron dose it could sustain. So as you see at the end of the process, we had a cumulative dose of 560 electrons per angstrom square. And judging by the, the micrographs here, the shape was maintained, the structure seems to still retain its uh, sphericity and from the beginning and from the end. And we did again this size distribution with time. And as you see, the narrow peak was maintained uh, in the four second uh, video acquisition which suggests the structure was preserved in the solvent. So this was a, a, an interesting consideration for our future protein studies. So with this, I just want to um, say some consideration on electron doses. So the, the total charge in the specimen illuminated area can be estimated by uh, this equation here, where IS is the specimen being intensity, uh, delta, epsilon, and epsilon zero are the medium conductivity and relative permittivity respectively. So uh, DA water has a conductivity of 5, 10 to minus 6 Siemens per meter. And the PBS we used in our solution has a conductivity of 2 Siemens per meter. You see there the change in magnitude. So assuming that the illumination conditions are the same for both media and with the water relative permittivity of um, 80, the specimen charge in DA water will be 4, 10 to 5 higher than in PBS. And this specimen charge will be even greater in vitrified water because of the low conductivity of vitrified water. And so we would expect ferritin to have a much higher charge between 1 to 3 orders of magnitude in vitrified than in liquid water. So in the case of proteins and general biological organic materials, we can effectively increase beam illumination threshold and, uh, for protein samples when they're imaged via liquid phase EM. I present you here um, some work we did on intrinsically disordered proteins. This is in collaboration with Xavi Salvatella at the IRB in Barcelona and Carla Garcia. So, um, and here we studied CPEB4, which is a protein that is altered in the brains of individuals with autism. It is known that environmental factors that alter brain development, such as infections during pregnancy, can also contribute to the onset of autism. And CPEB4 is a possible link between environmental factors and the genes that predispose to um, autism. So from the materials perspective, um, CPEB4 is in monomeric state, and when it is unphosphorylated, it undergoes a liquid phase uh, separation, liquid liquid phase separation. We know it forms monomers uh, from uh, a size of around 10 nanometers, and they evolve to larger species forming droplets of circa 50 nanometers in size. And we wanted to study this transition with a liquid TM. So as you see here in the micrograph, um, we saw the monomers, which are these uh, little particles with really nice contrast. The size was in good agreement with what we knew from uh, analytical techniques from uh, DLS. And uh, we saw different coexisting structures. We saw the droplets, like in here, with no monomers on the outside. You can distinguish perhaps the shape of some monomers on the inside. And you saw mono we saw monomers as well, with some, sorry, we saw droplets as well with some monomers um, attached to the outside part. So this was quite interesting. Also, the uh, contrast was rather good. If we zoom in one of these uh, droplets, we can see the monomer aggregation with the shape of the monomers inside the droplets. And uh, this diagram here shows the multi-phase structuring that this protein can adopt, so uh, the different steps. But how does the maduration of the droplets happen? 
And this has been studied with DLS at the beginning and at the end of the process and with light microscopy for larger structures, but there is no studies done with EM methods. And so we thought uh, it would be good to put it in liquid CM and see whether we could attempt to see some uh, the, the maturation of the droplets. So here I show you um, a CPEB4 at 2.5 milligrams per mil in NAPI phosphate, 20 millimolars. And what we see is the nucleation of the protein into aggregates of different sizes, starting from the monomer of 10 nanometers into structures of 30 to 40 nanometers. Um, this uh, you can see very nicely the lots of little monomers here dancing on the background. This has been um, it's been put much faster than the video is, but and you see how the structures form. And even you can see some soft interfaces between the structures and the outside, like, a, like some sort of ring in here. So this video wasn't as we acquired. This video has been clean, has been processed using the noise to void neural network developed by the Jack Lab. And this approach tries to estimate the noiseless pixels in an image without the need of the corresponding clean image. So we could see quite nicely the formation of the droplets. So with this, I have concluded the first block of my talk. I've talked about some challenges and some opportunities. And now I'm going to introduce the second part, which is advanced techniques towards uh, 4D microscopy. So I'm going to go back to the concept of time here. I mean, that's the that's the, the title of the talk, 4D includes the time. So we want to include, we want to explore, excuse me, the time concept. And so an asymmetric object is the perfect platform for exploring browning dynamics and applying our method. Here I show you a disk like micelle rotating in water. And now what we want to do is follow this single particle through time in the different frames that um, we've acquired. So it took us a long time to discover that our polymer can also form these like micelles because when you image this structure in dry TM, what you're going to see is um, like a flat pancake, as you see it from above, because uh, these structures show preferential orientation when it's prepared for a uh, dry TM. So, uh, and you see, you can see here the, the disk showing you all the different sites, all the different profiles, dancing really nicely in front of us. So we call this technique Brownian tomography, and here we follow a single object through time. We're not rotating the holder, the material is rotating for us in liquid. So you see here a time color palette showing the sequences of the disk like micelle when it's rotating in the different frames. So each color shows you a profile that we've, that we've screened in the video. So in order to reconstruct uh, the structure first, we had to pre-process these videos. So the noise had to be reduced by a medium filter. Uh, we removed the salt and pepper specifically and very white and very black pixels. We applied a sharpening algorithm to restore high accuracy and details. And then we started the 3D reconstruction process, which we did with a software called Cypium that we borrowed for, from CryoTM. So first of all, we just track the particle's motion. Then we apply a contrast transfer function estimation and correction step to reduce the blur effect of the microscope. Then the particles were identified, extracted, and an angular orientation was assigned to all. We created a gallery containing all the 2D particle profiles. And we got a low resolution initial model uh, it's important to say that we didn't need a priori model for this initial model. And finally, a 3D refined model was, um, was achieved. And I'm just going to show you now uh, the model that we generated. So this is the generated 3D structure with one nanometer resolution. And this is enough to see the features on the surface. So we were quite pleased with this first reconstruction and we wanted to validate it. So in order to validate it, we compare it with a coarse grain model of the structure, which is in here. So in A, you see the coarse grain model of the PMPC PDPA chain, the single chain in water. We have reduced, we have coursed this from 2,536 atoms to 316 bits. In B, you get the end-to-end -end distance of the chain when it's located at the core 
and at the edge areas of the disk like Mars. And this end-to-end -end distance is a very typical um, concept used in polymer physics. In C, uh, you see the three-dimensional rendering of the disk like Mars reconstruction in three different views. And in D, there is a comparison between the coarse grain model and the Brownian tomography model in two orientations and a cross section. And we show the hydrophobic core surrounded by the hydrophilic brush. And as you see, the match is, is good. It's a good match. I'm going to jump to another example where we have also used liquid CM. And these are urease coated mesoporous silica nanomotors. These nanomotors have been investigated by Samuel Sanchez at the IVEC in Barcelona in really nice studies for targeting bladder cancer with uh, Samuel Sanchez and Paul Soto. And this is an ongoing collaboration we have. So the urease in the nanomotors use the urea in the bladder as the substrate for uh, self proportion. And we wanted to see, we wanted to investigate whether the structure of the particles of the, these nanomotors and the possible change of the structure when exposed to urea played a role in the propulsion mechanism. So I'm just going to show you what we've done so far which is the control system with the virus-like urease-coated silica and with no urea. So uh, we wanted to reconstruct the structures as I've shown before for the disk like muscle with these urea motors. And this is what we did. We first dry the system in dry TM conditions in here. And you see some really nice particles, very high contrast. The spikes are really nicely defined. The spikes are here because it's a virus like, so they wanted to mimic the viral, the viral structure. You see as well the mesoporous structure of the silica on the inside. And we, once we knew what the particles look like, then we uh, imaged it in liquid. And of course, as you see here, uh, the contrast is very different in liquid as it is in dry. And this is what you see when you image in liquid. Um, we did uh, 100 frames, 10 frames per second, 1 milligram per mil. And this is the particle here that we want to follow through time along the 100 frames and reconstruct. This is after processing the video and cleaning it and applying neural networks. This is the contrast that we have on these particles. This is another example of another video where at the beginning, with if you don't have a trained eye, you would see there's nothing there. I mean, what are we going to reconstruct? But if you do some processing and you sum all the frames to get more contrast and you average all the particles, these are the particles. So we do have the particles there. And, uh, and this is the reconstruction um, that we did with um, reconstructing three nanomotors. You can see the urease nicely coating the surface. And the three of them are from the same uh, science range and it corresponds well with the size that we know the nanomotors have. And you see as well some sort of, it's like a cage structure where you see the coating, but there are some, I don't know if there are holes or something is missing on the inside. And if you compare it with the dry image, which you see the spikes as well as, as you see here, the coverage, we wonder whether, um, what we don't see on the inside, these gaps in here are the mesosporous uh, silica structure from the core. So um, we need to investigate further and put in the in the in the holder now the just the silica and the silica particles without urease, just to see whether we're picking up here the mesosporous um, silica structure. But I'm gonna go back to um, to proteins, and here I'm gonna introduce the second method for 3D reconstruction. And it's called Brownian particle analysis. And in here, we follow many particles, not just one as before. So this is the ferritin that I showed you before. We work with the K2 in linear mode. This was the first video, successful video of ferritin that we took, uh, 10 frames per second, 100 frames. Uh, we don't have face plates, so contrast is a big issue for us. So we work with high defocus values of more than 10 microns and an electron dose of 139 electrons per angstrom square per second. So uh, we did the same thing as before. Uh, we followed the particles through time. We assigned a particle profile extraction, orientations assignment. We used the first 50 frames. And in A, you can see how we tracked the particles through different uh, frames. And in B, it's just an example of the contrast we working with and the an example of different profiles acquired from ferritin. 
And with this, we reconstructed, we reconstructed the structure, and this is the 3D density map of ferritin we generated. Um, it's important to say that in this case, with liquid, uh, the map was done out of uh, 5,200 profiles. Now, these profiles doesn't mean necessarily the same number of particles, because you can have different profiles of the same particle uh, screen in different frames, so the same particle may be rotating and you can have different sides of it. Uh, we had a medium resolution or 4.8 angstroms. And in order to validate our reconstruction, we need to compare it with the ground truth from the polymer database, which is the X-ray model. So the size fits well and the structure seems to be a good fit as well. So um, something else we did is we pushed even more the temporal component. And here I show you the temporal evolution of the density map reconstruction process. So what we did is the five second long video that I showed you before, we segmented it in one second sub videos. And within each one second segments, we took a thousand particles and reconstructed the structure. So the structures don't vary much as the structure I showed you before from the long video. But as you see at the end of the acquisition, some patches start to um, be seen in the reconstructions here. The coverage is not as good as at the beginning of the, of the video. And we think this is the protein getting a bit damaged from the beam. Uh, we compared the Gaussian smoothing of, of the structure seen in this video um, above with the X-ray model. And, and this is the fit that you see. But another thing we did is uh, we studied the correlation because we know in cryo-EM, the correlation uh, is the parameter that measures how good your model is, how good, how, how, the, the, how good your model fits the X-ray model. And for cryo-EM, the correlation for ferritin is 0 0.77. We have a, a range of different correlation values, but quite similar to each other. And the best correlation, this more similar correlation to the cryo one was for the second reconstruction at 0 0.71. So, um, you know, we're getting closer. And the cumulative dose for these five second videos was of 700 electrons per angstrom square after the five, uh, the four seconds acquisition. Uh, something that we can say as well is that the resolution didn't change uh, during the acquisition. So the resolution was between 5.2, 5.4, 5.7. So quite similar in these time intervals. So if we compare the three uh, models, this is the liquid TM model here generated from liquid TM. In the middle is the model generated from cryo EM. And on the right is the model from X-ray. So I just want to say some considerations. So the generated density map from liquid TM is coarser. You can see it's coarser than the map generated from cryo EM. And even though our rest map calculations suggest spatial resolution be below the alpha helices, we don't see alpha helices. And this is something that we've been thinking about for a long time. So it's worth mentioning that ferritin remain intractable to structure determination by cryo EM for a long time. And this is because the contrast that was seen individual particles wasn't good enough for alpha helices to be seen, to be resolved. And you do need alpha helices for aligning the images to each other and thus superimpose the image structures. So this problem was resolved using a gold support and selecting the images of proteins with reduced motion in the gold grids. I mean, don't forget, we're looking at cryo images, so they are vitrified, but still they do have some motion. So the, the, the particles that were chosen were the ones that were most fixed, if you like. So the next logical question for us is to ask ourselves, what is the role of protein dynamics in the reconstruction? And so, um, we did some uh, molecular dynamic simulations. So in order to understand this, we performed low molecular dynamic simulations of ferritin in solution, 150 millimolars of sodium chloride. Now we studied the probability distribution function of the 24 chains that form uh, the ferritin, which are depicted as the letters of the alphabet in the, here in this graph. And we saw the root, uh, the root mean square displacements. And 
what we saw was there's no particular interchain rearrangement. So there's only 1.5 room mean square displacement of the chains in the simulation. And this is small for such a large complex. Um, so uh, this is the model representing of the 24 chains. But if we overlay the molecular dynamic simulation I just showed you of the 24 chains of everything together, what you get is a blur structure where it's impossible to distinguish the chain secondary um, arrangements. So you see here in A, you see on the on the left the chains as if they, as if they are completely fixed, and in the right hand side you see the chains as they are when they are constantly moving in solution. So this is like a blur structure. And if we overlap the molecular dynamics overlay with the map we generated, the match results to be rather good. So here is probably uh, the point of the talk, which is probably the most important message that I would like you to take home today. Because this optimal match suggests the key abilities of liquid phase to access first the conformational spatial flexibility of the protein, then the capture of the protein dynamics together with conserved structural features, which is a spherical core structure. But we have rotational correlation times of one microsecond. We have internal structure vibrations in nanosecond times. So the reconstructions are time averaged and represent the volume occupied by all the protein conformations within the time scale used for imaging, which is around 100 milliseconds. This time scale is the frame rate of acquisition of our camera. So um, the next thing that we, uh, the next logical thing would be how can you improve this time scale? time scale for imaging, can you make it faster? And we have a K2IS, I mean, we have capability of uh, 1600 frames per second, so we definitely should be able to go faster. So what happens if we go faster? We are, we're imaging organic materials, so the contrast is very low. So this is the contrast at 10 frames per second, at 20 and 40. So as you see, as the frame rate increases, the electron dose decreases and the noise goes up and we hardly see anything. So we are constrained by the contrast of our materials here. Another thing we did was lowering the electron doses to those similar to cryo ultra low electron doses, like 0.9 electrons per angstrom square per second. The contrast goes down again, and this is the ferritine with the same conditions, except for the dose as for the video I showed you before. And we reconstructed. So what you see at the top is the video, uh, the reconstruction from the video at 700 electrons per angstrom square. What you see at the bottom is the video from these ultra low doses. It's less than 10 electrons per angstrom square in five second videos. And there is some patches missing on the surface. There's not much information on that surface. So in order to uh, improve it, with, we compromised the time and we average um, two frames, we averaged five frames, and we averaged 10 frames. So like I say, you compromise the time component, but you improve the contrast. So this is the work we did with ferritin, which is, uh, at the end of all, is like a ball, is a symmetric protein. So if we want to push the technique a bit further, we need to work with a protein that is asymmetric, and this is what we have done. This is a, another collaboration we have with uh, Finn Werner and Simona Pilotto, which are structural biologists at UCL. So they routinely image in cryo this asymmetric protein, which is archaea RNA polymerase. And this protein has a stalk here and a clamp. And it's very flexible. So they know that the stalk rotates in almost all directions when it is in solution and the clamp open and closes up. And uh, when, when this protein is imaged in cryo, the clamp is mainly closed. This is the most favorable conformation they see in cryo imaging. When we image it in liquid, this is what we saw. Uh, again, it's very hard to distinguish the structures. And we use the same dose as uh, Simona and Finn used in their cryo study. We try to replicate their experiments. And uh, again, if you process the video, you sum the 10 frames, you see here what we're really looking at. These are the particles we want to reconstruct. Um, we did the same thing as we had done for the ferritin. So we did it with many particles. And here you see a reconstruction of um, six different RNA polymerase 
taken from six different videos and there are 5,000 particles for each reconstruction or 5,000 profiles, if you like. So you see here that each of the reconstructed structure is slightly different from each other. So um, we think that we are seeing different conformations in the RNA polymerase. We see that the shape of the movement is detected, we believe. We believe we see a comet effect as the protein stock move from one side to the other. And this is sort of the freedom of movement of this stock. And according to the cryo specialist, to Finn and Simona, uh, this, the, the clamp seems to be in an open uh, conformation. And these reconstructions were done by Gabriel Inc. From, uh, from chemistry at UCL. So with this, I conclude my presentation today. And I conclude by uh, saying that liquid phase TM can be used effectively to image soft matter and proteins. We can screen the full three-dimensional profile of the specimen. We can reconstruct protein structures in liquid water. And we can reconstruct um, reducing the acquisition time that is required to collect the particle profiles from hours in cryo TM to seconds. Most importantly, uh, the Brownian particle analysis allows extending structural biology into dynamic structural biology. And so we believe that our findings expand soft matter and structural biology studies into dynamics, where we can sample soft particles and proteins within a three dimension plus time, a 4D space. So with this, I finish, and I thank you all for your attention. I want to thank at UCL, Professor Giuseppe Battaglia, which is the director of the uh, facility, uh, Cesare De Pace, Gabriele Marchello, Gabriel Ng, Dr. Ciro Vasquez, Dr. Raduro Castano, Dr. Steve Perth, uh, Professor, Professor Francesco Gervasio, Dr. Silvia Costa Gutierrez, Professor Finn Bernard, Dr. Simona Piloto, Abgata, Neil Wilkinson, Dr. Mike Ward, Jill, uh, Andy Jarwood, Dr. Takeo, Takeo Sasaki, at Dance, Dr. Hugo Perez, Olaf Veller, Dr. Mathilde Lemang, at the IRV in Barcelona, Dr. Xavier Salvatella, Carla Garcia, at the IVEC, Dr. Samuel Sanchez, Dr. Paul Soto, the APSRC, which is the Engineer and Physical Sciences Research Council. And I thank you all for your attention today. Thank you. And now I just ask you if you have any questions for me. All right. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Lorena, for your presentation. Uh, first, I had two questions uh, from our side, um, because uh, as you mentioned, your lab has uh, also recently acquired the stream system and will be using it uh, soon. So my question was uh, for your re research, which new possibilities uh, will the stream system give you? Uh, well, the stream system, I'm just going to put the camera now. Um, the stream system has the option of um, reducing the bulging of the window when you put it in the in the microscope. So as you know, the, the ocean, uh, well, any liquid uh, cell, when you close the liquid cell and you insert it in the microscope, because of the um, differential pressure inside the microscope, you get an effective bulging of the windows, which translates in thicker water layers. With the stream, you can apply a negative pressure and suck out a bit of uh, that liquid and reduce that liquid thickness. And, they reduce, uh, and if you reduce the liquid thickness, that means that particles and materials with low contrast, such as what I presented today, can be imaged with better contrast because the path is, is shorter. So this is one thing. If you have a better contrast, then you can go faster. Perhaps you can go at higher uh, frame rates in your camera, so you can uh, improve the temporal resolution. But also, uh, reduced liquid thicknesses means you can also do analytical TM in liquid. So uh, you can do EOS and you can do FTM, because uh, perhaps you have a liquid thickness in between, I don't know, 200 nanometers, two or 300 nanometers, which would be good for analytical TM. And another thing is the stream has an improved flow dynamic system when compared to, to the ocean, so that you can perform experiments in flow more efficiently in the stream than you would do in the ocean. So I think these advantages uh, would definitely um, have a difference in, in, you know, in a system like ours in low contrast organic materials. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for that uh, answer. And maybe shortly, because we, at the moment, we also have a temporary sales offer on our ocean system, the system that enabled your research that you presented today. So can you give a few words on the, the, the benefits of the ocean systems, especially, I think, for new people, uh, people who start in this field? Well, I think the um, the ocean. Um, I think I can think of two uh, two advantages of the ocean uh, holder. First, it's uh, easier to mount the liquid cell. So you have the two chips, and it's uh, it's relatively fast. Uh, once you are you have experience on it, you can mount the whole system um, within I don't know 15 minutes perhaps. So this is an advantage because for the stream it takes longer. To uh, assemble um, the liquid cell. Um, another another important aspect is that the um, the chips, the windows for the ocean holder are you know more cost effective. They are cheaper than the windows of the stream because the windows of the stream come. To my understanding, they come with the electrodes, while the ocean ones are just just chips. So um, these are the main two advantages I would think for the ocean holder. So if you're gonna start um, if you're going to start uh, the field of liquid CM, I would advise to start with the ocean because it's, it's, a, it's a more accessible holder, if you like. All right. Experience. And now we go to the questions of the audience. Uh, in the meantime, we have several questions coming in. So let's start with the first one from uh, Thierry Epiche from CNR CNRS from France. And I will read this question for you. So he posts, during the Brownian tomography, how do we check whether the object does not stick from time to time to one of the sealing membranes? Uh, then introducing possible bias in the reconstruction or even inducing deformation of its shape. Okay. So you've asked like three different sub questions. Yeah, I, think, I, think we, I think the first question is the question, uh, and then the the other one are the the, the things that happen if this. And okay. I think it also talks yeah. about the uh, stream. So, yeah. So the first question is, uh, what happens if the particle is sometimes stuck to the windows? Is that it, or the membranes? Yeah, how do you check if the object is not sticking? How do you know if the object isn't sticking to the ceiling membrane? Oh, we do it. Well, it's very clear to know because sometimes uh, you take the video and the object is just immobile. It just doesn't do anything. It doesn't it doesn't flicker or it doesn't translate. It's just there, static, and it doesn't do anything. And then what you do is you play with the dose. You try to uh, you know, make it move by uh, applying a very high dose and it doesn't do anything to the object. So that means the object is just not moving and that happens often because we cannot really control um, the, the, the place of the object that we're imaging because these objects move also in the set direction. So sometimes they're in the bulk, but sometimes they are in, the, in an interfacial layer. If your window is here, it's well known that uh, close to the interface you have a reduced viscosity region. So objects that are placed in that area will move definitely less than objects that are in the bulk. Sometimes, because we plasma discharge the windows, you would get from the very beginning some objects that are just stuck to the windows. So these objects are good for imaging them and spending some time and see what they look like. But if you want to reconstruct, you do need objects that move you need objects that are not completely stuck and so uh, in the case of the objects that move we don't really care if they are uh, in the bulk or if they are in an area that move less all we need is just to see some profiles or enough profiles to actually be able to reconstruct so i hope i've answered the question it's very very clear when an object doesn't move and doesn't rotate yeah i hope so too um... So one of the next questions is from Vita. Um, Vita, nice to see you again at this webinar. And Vita wants to ask you if you can comment on the sample preparation. Any pre-treatment of the chips and how about proteins sticking to the tubing? Ah, that's a good question. So for I'm gonna start with the, 
with the chips. So for the chips, we clean them. Uh, we first clean them with uh, acetone and with ethanol for around two minutes each. First, we put it in, ac in uh, acetone. And after those two minutes, we put it in ethanol. And with this, we just removed any impurities they may have on the surface. And after that, we plasma discharge with air. And we plasma discharge for quite a long time. We did a, a, a series of uh, different uh, plasma discharge uh, timings, and we saw that long times work rather well for us. So we did th we do 13 minutes of air discharge. So with this, we extra clean the surface from further impurities, and we assure that the surfaces are very hydrophilic, so that your solution just uh, is not is not lost in the flower shape of the um, of the holder so that it's taking place. So at the beginning, uh, we used to flow in our proteins, that's right. But the flow dynamics of the uh, ocean holder is not as good as the stream holder. So you don't get as much sample in between your cells, which is where you want it. So what we do now is we pre-fill the tubes with the same solvent as the solvent you use for your sample. So the tubes are pre-filled with just the solvent and we treat our chips with, uh, and we just deposit uh, a very small amount, 1.5 microliters of the solution we want to image. We close it, and that's how we image it now. So you make sure that your your um, your tubes are filled in; they're not they're not empty or anything, so there is no way it's going to escape. And and your full circuit is 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 filled, and you close the inlet and the outlet tubes. And this is the the optimal way we found for imaging our proteins. At the beginning, we lost, uh, we, we employed a, you know, a long time finding which was the best way to put the sample where we wanted it. And this is not an easy task. I mean, now I present this and it seems that we got it right from the beginning, but no, it took us quite a long time to work out what was the best way to not get block tubes, to get the sample sandwiched in between the chips and not in the reservoir, to get also the right volume, because sometimes if you increase a little bit the volume, and by the time you drop cast your volume, you close the low, you know, close it. Uh, sometimes it has dried, and if your sample has dried, as in the case of ferritin that has iron and it's a, a dark solution, you form like a thick dark film in there already, and it's thick enough for the beam not to go through. So that's a problem as well, because when you put it under the microscope, you don't see anything. And then at the beginning, you wonder why I not see anything. And then you understand that the, the, the film is so thick that it's uh, hardly any water. So there is a lot of different caveats to getting the right sample prep. Mm. All right. So maybe the last question is by uh, Patricia Koiman. She asks you if you can give uh, some more details about imaging conditions to obtain the high contrast. <laughs> I wish I could. Um, the high contrast. Um, well, if you're imaging, and there are many different uh, ways, if you're imaging uh, something that contains uh, metallic particles or metals, uh, you get better contrast, I find, in STEM, in dark field. That gives you a better contrast uh, with a small uh, spot size. It gives you a better contrast. However, if you want to take a video in STEM, unless you have Digiscan, um, if you use a, a software that works as a skin recorder, the resolution and the quality of that video is not that good if you want to do post analysis of the video. So for that, it's better to use a, a proper, um, you know, direct detection low dose camera. So to get enough contrast, the thinner the water layer, the better to get the contrast. And to work, I mean, you need to reduce the dose, so you do need your apertures. You do put the objective aperture and try to, uh, with the objective aperture, you, usually you get uh, more contrast. Uh, apart from that, it's just thinner, thinner layers. And at the beginning, this is another trick as well that uh, we do sometimes because you have your water there, your thickness with certain thickness, and you know that when you put it in the in the microscope, the, the and you have the windows, right? The middle is always thicker because it's where the windows bulge more. So you image at the corners, which are brighter, and this is uh, they have a reduced thickness. 
And even though sometimes at the beginning, even though they are less thick, they're still thick to get enough contrast. So if you wait a little bit, usually by the mid end of the session, the water, as you know, the water tends to evaporate a little bit and that leaves you pockets of reduced thickness. Sometimes there's like a water a air vapor interface and this has an effect in thickness and the thickness at that point sometimes is low enough for you to have a definitely improved contrast. So these are the tricks that I would use. Wait, give you some time and image at the end of the session or in the middle of the session, blank the beam, just leave the sample there and the water tends to uh, go lower so that you have a better contrast. All right. And with that, I want to close this webinar and uh, say a, a big thanks to Lorena. Uh, Lorena, thank you very much for giving your presentation. Well, thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. And thank you to the audience everywhere in the world uh, for joining. And we hope to see you in the next webinar. And that brings us to the end of this nano talk. To stay informed about upcoming webinars, I invite you to follow our social media channels, LinkedIn and Twitter. I also invite you to sign up for our monthly newsletter in which we share interesting in situ research and technological innovations. I want to thank you for watching and hope to meet you at one of our next webinars.